Hello, welcome to Time of Death. This is episode 18, and I am half of your hosts. I'm Riss. And I'm Dee. And for those of you who are new here, this is Time of Death. We are two nurses who like to talk about true crime cases. We have medical and psychiatric backgrounds, and we just like to talk about it and share you in our world. We also have humor. (laughs) <laughs> wonderful senses of humor if you catch my drift which makes this podcast 10 times better along with the insights and i think good banter i think that banter really is the selling point of this podcast you have to come up with something witty to really show <laughs> we really got to shine this episode now that you, you talked us up so much yes i am the official hype woman and yeah, that's uh, you all right it's Riss's turn this week so let's get into it all right so this week, we're going to be talking about Richard Speck. I know this name. Do you know the case? I think I do. Okay. So, actually, Richard Speck, his birthday is today. Freaky. And he was born December 6, 1941, in Kirkwood, Illinois. I had no idea till I thought about it. But today <laughs> is December 6th, so. Isn't Kirkwood the brand at oh, Kirkland at Costco? That sounds familiar to me. I don't know, though. Clint. I don't know. I've never actually been to Costco. Really? Yeah. I've heard a lot of good things about it, but I have not been. Never stepped foot into the store. Yet. They have very good pizza. So his family moved to Dallas, Texas, and he grew up mostly in Dallas. Um, he is the seventh child of eight kids. Um, And he comes from a pretty low-income family. He had a pretty rough childhood growing up. As his childhood and teen years went on, he would frequently get in trouble with the law. He drank a lot. He Mm -hmm. had a lot of public disturbance issues. At age 21, he was convicted of forging a signature on a stolen check. And Mm -hmm. he robbed a grocery store and got sentenced to three years in prison. He ended up actually getting parole and was released after 16 months. And interestingly enough, he returned one week later after he violated his parole and he was charged with aggravated assault. So it didn't last long for him out in the non-prison world. So after, you know, all these run-ins with the law, he's got a pretty bad rap. And so he moves to Chicago in 1966. He has a sister there. And so he moved in with his sister and his brother-in-law, and his brother-in-law actually helped him get a job as an apprentice seaman. So typically, these seamen in this position would check in at a hiring hall in Chicago to try to get assigned to a vessel to get to work. So this is in South Chicago. So after a couple days, Beck is checking in. He can't find work, so he's not having any luck. One day, he's unable to find work yet again, and he's wandering around the neighborhood, and across from the hiring hall is Luella Park. And from Luella Park, he is able to see the backyard of a townhouse. A townhouse, for those of you who don't know, it's a string of houses, and they share walls with one another. And... The South Chicago Community Hospital School of Nursing rents out three of those townhomes for their students and also for international nurses as well. Because this is the guy that killed the nursing students, right? Yeah. He killed two of two of them? No, he killed eight. Eight? Yeah. Did he bite someone's ear off or am no. confusing him with Bundy? You're confusing him. Okay, continue. All right. In the third townhouse, number 2319, nine women lived. Six of them were nursing students, and three of them were international nurses, and all three were from the Philippines. And all of these women worked at the local South Chicago Community Hospital at this time. So the South Chicago Community Hospital School of Nursing was very strict. Marriage wasn't allowed. Pregnancy was not allowed. Um, It was like a boot camp, basically. No makeup, jewelry, nail polish were allowed. All the women there had to have perfect white uniforms and their shoes had to have no scuffs. They Mm -hmm. just needed to be like tip top. Hunky dory. 
they had to be very professional, very mm-hmm. clean, very really on top of it. The students at the school were required to live in the dorms attached to the hospital for their first two years. But the girls in this town home all decided in their final year, their third year, that they were going to move into a townhouse together. So their townhouse setup is they've got downstairs, a living room, powder room, and kitchen. And then upstairs, there's three bedrooms. And there's a mix of single beds and bunk beds and a bathroom. So all the nursing students were very close with one another. They love to joke around with each other. All the nursing students are weeks away from graduating. And international nurses were friendly with them. They didn't get especially close, but they were all yeah. very amicable. Like camaraderie. The yeah. Terrors of nursing school. Exactly. Meanwhile, Speck is able to see this townhouse. And he's likely able to see the women coming in and out of it. Um, there is a car that comes to get the nurses to bring them to the hospital. So it's likely that he knew that it was all women living in this townhome. That night, he slept in the park and he planned their murders. So I'm just going to go into who the victims are. There's eight of them and one survivor. Uh, Nina Schmal was a great student. She loved Elvis. She loves cats, the color pink. I mean, actually, she was a couple years older than the other students. Most of the students are in their 20s, along with the um, international nurses as well. Um, but Nina, it took her a little time to decide on nursing. And originally, she planned to be a secretary, but she didn't like it. Mm. Um, but she had been volunteering at a nursing home, and she loved it. And actually, she even bought some of the residents' Christmas gifts. Sweet. So very sweet. Suzanne Ferris. Her brother carries her photo in his wallet. She's described as being pretty, perky, popular, and very kind. Her little brother recalls her teaching him how to make a grilled cheese sandwich in their childhood kitchen, and he remarks how he always felt so safe around his big sister. And her father nicknamed her Cookie, and the day she died, he wept, and he said this nickname over and over. Terrible. Mary Ann Jordan, she wanted to go on to get her bachelor's in nursing. She was known for her sense of humor. Her grandma was a highly regarded surgical nurse, and this inspired Mary Ann to become a nurse. Mm -hmm. But also she had a very special connection with her little brother, Billy. Billy had Down syndrome. Their relationship set the stage for her to become a pediatric nurse. They had a beautiful relationship, and um, she was really passionate about caring for him. She had actually moved back home, but she was still very close with the girls who lived in the townhome. And Mary Ann's brother was actually engaged to her roommate, Suzanne Ferris. Oh, wow. On July 13th, Phil and Suzanne stopped by their family's house. And Suzanne invited Mary Ann to spend the night at the townhouse. And she's like, we could start to plan my wedding. Like, we can have a lot of fun. Like, why don't you just come over? So... Suzanne and Marianne get to the townhouse and they walk in at 12.15 a.m. Pamela Wilkening is described as being quiet and studious. And actually, during her psychiatric rotation, Pam was punched by a patient and she smacked her head on a brick wall and she got a concussion. And she returned to her nursing duties unfazed. Like, that is a true champ because... Yes, she's a champ. I don't think that would have completely swayed me. I know, yeah, I would have been like, yeah, no, psych is not it for me. Um, So Pam actually was going to visit her family the weekend before, but she told her mom, I'm really busy studying, like I've only got a couple weeks left, so that's the last time that her and her mom spoke. Wow. Gloria Davey, she was born actually at the South Chicago Community Hospital, and now there actually is a scholarship in her honor. Mm-hmm. She was described as being determined, creative, and headstrong. And actually, Gloria was going to be moving back in with her family the day after she was murdered. And her three little sisters could not wait to see her. And she actually called her mom that night to tell her mom not to worry. She was home safe, like she always called her before she went to bed. 
Patricia Matus um, is the next nursing student. When Pat was 14 years old, her cousin was dying. And so after high school, she would go visit him and help take care of him. So she would bring him water, tell him she loved him, hold his hand, just really mm-hmm. be there for him. So she would often walk home from these visits crying. But also this experience is what made her want to become a nurse. Very powerful. Yes. So Patricia was described as being sweet, assertive, funny, and full of life. On July 13th, her best friend dropped her off at home at 10.30 p.m. And Pat asked her best friend, Arlene, um, if she wanted to come in for a coffee before she went home. And Arlene said, you know what, I'm too tired. I'm just going to go home. And that is the last time that they saw each other. And then I'm going to go on to talk about the Filipino nurses. Valentina Pezion, she went by Tina. She was actually born on Valentine's Day. She had graduated the year before from Manila Central University, and she was in the top 10 of her class. Um, There actually was an issue with her passport, which forced her to reschedule her trip to the U.S. twice. And her sister thinks back now. Um, that it may have been a sign that God didn't want her to leave. Get it. Absolutely get it. So all three of the Filipino nurses came to the U.S. because there was nursing shortage Mm -hmm. even then, and they were able to make more money in the U.S. as nurses, and all three of these nurses sent back money to their family. So Tina sending money back to her family, and she was considered a good cook. Her and the other Filipino nurses would often have dinner together, and some of the other international nurses would also come over, and they'd all eat together. And Valentina shared a bedroom with a few of the nursing students. So two of the Filipino nurses lived in the same or slept in the same room, and then Valentina slept in another room with a couple of the other nursing students. Ralita Gargulo is the oldest of nine. She's from the Philippines as well. And two of her sisters actually went on to become nurses. Merlita is described as quiet, shy, pretty, and hardworking. Um, She would often sing when she was doing household chores, and she had a beautiful voice. She and another one of the international nurses, Corazon, met on the airplane bound for Chicago. Wow. And when her body and Valentina's bodies were flown back to Manila, A hundred of their friends and family members waited in the rain to unload their bodies from the airplane. So Merlita was roommates with Cora. Cora is on MRO. And Cora is the lone survivor. She is brave and courageous, and you'll see that throughout the story. She graduated from nursing school in Manila, and she worked in the Philippines for a few years before coming to the U.S. in May 1966. On July 13th, she went to work, and then she came home. She came home at 3 p.m., and she ate supper with Tina and Merlita, and then she took a nap, woke up, did some laundry. She was very homesick, so she wrote Mm -hmm. a couple letters to her family members and friends back home, and then she went to bed at 10.30 p.m. Around 11 p.m., she heard four knocks at her bedroom door. Earlier that night, Speck went to a bar where he usually would spend his day bar hopping, drinking, talking to women. Mm. Um, So he goes to a bar, and he met Ella May Hooper. And he actually ended up sexually assaulting Ella, and he stole a gun out of her handbag. Wow. So after he went back out drinking, he's playing pool, he's flashing his knife and his new stolen gun to everybody there, and just being pretty bold. And at 10.30 p.m., he walks out of the bar. At 11 p.m., he gets to the nurse's townhome. It's about a one-mile walk from the bar. Uh, He uses a knife to pry the screen door open and unlock the back door. 
So Speck goes up the stairs and he stops at Cora and Merlita's room. And he knocks on their bedroom door four times. Cora, meanwhile, is awake. Merlita is sleeping. Cora gets up and unlocks the door. And Cora remembers seeing a lanky man. He's wearing dark clothes. He's got slicked back hair. And she recalls he has pockmarked skin. Mm. And he has a gun in his hand. And he's got a whole bunch of tattoos. So Speck herds Cora and five other nurses into the biggest bedroom that they have. And he ties up all the nurses' hands using strips of bed sheets. And at first, the nursing students and the nurses were like, okay, he's obviously drunk. This guy is, has been drinking heavily all night. And they're like, he's probably just going to steal from us. They're very alarmed and scared, but they're not they're thinking. Rationalizing. They're not aware of the route this night is going to go down yet. So this escalates pretty quickly. At 11.45 p.m., a 22-year-old Gloria Davy gets home from a date that she had, and Speck had crouched behind the door, and he took her at gunpoint, and then he added her to the row of nurses that he had all tied up. Mm. At 12.45 a.m., a neighboring student knocks on the door to see if she could borrow bread for a sandwich, but no one answered, mm. so she left. And she had no idea what was going on within that home. Or for the best thing that she... I know. But that's still, like, they were so close to having someone... Exactly. ...find out. So, Speck takes Pam Wilkening first. And he takes her out of the room where all the nurses are gathered, and he brings her into another room. And Mary Ann Jordan and Suzanne Ferris, remember they decided to spend the night together planning the Suzanne's wedding. wedding. So the two of them come home a little bit before 1 a.m., and they surprised Richard. <sighs> he is very shocked. There was a struggle, and Suzanne ends up being strangled and stabbed 18 times. And Mary Ann ends up stabbed three times in her chest, once in her neck, and once in her eye. Oh, my. And then Pam was stabbed once in the heart. All three of these girls were found together. And then one by one, he starts taking the other nurses and nursing students out. And they're taken to another room. All of these women were either strangled or stabbed to death. Cora's very small. She's 4'10", and she ends up crawling under the bunk bed and hiding. And she stays under there for three hours. And during that time, she hears her peers all screaming. And she hears another Filipino nurse scream, Mazakit. I don't know if I'm saying that, but it's Tagalog, and it means it hurts. And then after she heard the Filipino nurse scream that, there was silence followed by running water. And then Richard would come back for another one. At 3.30 a.m., all the girls had been taken, except for Cora. So he goes back in the room, and he looks around. He had forgotten about her. Oh, my God. He didn't count. And he left. At 5.30 a.m., Cora comes out of the bed and sees all of her friends' bodies. And all of the blood has congealed because it was hot summer. And Cora is in shock. She screams out of an open window for 20 minutes until someone finally heard her. So Cora works with the police, even though she is so terrified that he's going to come back for her. Yeah. She is determined to help find the killer. And she helps develop a composite sketch in Speck's likeness. Okay. At 8.45 that morning on 100th and Torrance, the detectives questioned a gas station attendant who tipped them about a guy who came in asking if he could keep a couple suitcases 
for him overnight, and he also mentioned that he was a seaman. So they're like, okay, seaman, this is where all the seamen go. I'm going to go to the hiring hall. So the detectives go to the hiring hall, and they show a photo, or they show the drawing that was made of Speck. And at first, they didn't really recognize Speck from the drawing, and the detective leaves. And then he actually comes back later, and he shows them the drawing again. And they finally recognize him and fish his name out of somewhere. And it's Richard Speck's name. Meanwhile, Richard slept in. He went to the bars. It's a typical day. He woke up at 11 a.m. And he was in the bar when he heard, heard about the killings on the radio. So Richard goes back to his room. He's renting a motel room at this point. And so he had a message that he had gotten called by the hiring manager at the hiring hall. And the message said, we've got a job. You call us back. So he calls them back. And this is actually a trap to get Mm -hmm. him to come in. And he's like, all right, I'll be there within an hour. But he never showed up. He had caught on. Um, He ended up at Raleigh Hotel. um, And he actually ended up picking up a sex worker. So... Sex worker tells the police he has a gun the next morning, but he's far enough from Chicago or Uh, from, okay. he's far enough from where the murders occurred that they haven't been tipped off yet about him. So they just go into the room. They're like, all right, whatever. We're just going to go in the room, take the gun away. And the police officers are hurt saying to each other, oh, he's like harmless. And they walk out. Wow. Meanwhile, Cora picked out his picture from a lineup. So she's she's got him. And also there are fingerprints from the door at the nurse's home. And those are picked up. And we're waiting for the results of that. And the search is really starting to go hard right now. So next, Spec ends up on Skid Row. And he checks into Star Hotel and... The police are not thinking he's on Skid Row at this point. They're thinking he's a little bit of money, like Skid Row is probably not where he's going to end up. But he ends up there. So he's hiding away in Star Hotel, and his plan is to hop a freight train and get out of town. And at this point, the fingerprint comes back a match for Richard. And the news is going out, his face is everywhere, and he's in the newspaper. And Speck reads about his crimes in the newspaper. And he slashes his wrists in the bathroom at the Star Hotel to attempt suicide. And then he stumbles back into his room. And a clerk finds him and calls 911 later that night to get help for him. So he was brought to Cook County Hospital. Dr. Smith was a resident. And... He got a call that there was a trauma case for him to work on. So he's eating dinner in his office and he got a delivery, a newspaper delivery, and glanced at it and then he put it in his office. So then he goes to the case and he looks at the patient's face and he's, hold on a second. (laughs) So he goes back and he reads the newspaper article. He reads the whole thing, and he sees Cora's account of him having tattoos, including one that says, Born to Raise Hell. He's like, okay, this guy looks just like Richard Speck. So he goes back to the patient. He has blood covering his arms. He slashed his wrists. And so he takes an alcohol swab and swabs the blood off his arm. He sees a B on his arm. Oh, And then he keeps swabbing. He sees Born to Raise Hell. That's pretty distinctive. So Dr. Smith is like, okay, nurses, this is a wanted man. (laughs) And he was finally caught at this point three days after the murders occurred. By healthcare professionals, I just want to point out the irony in that. I know, right? My thought is probably not appropriate for the podcast. So again, I will be keeping my mouth shut. I have nothing nice to say. But I never believe suicide is the answer. No. I'm anti-suicide I even for scum. Exactly. Like that. Yes. Um, so the trial began on April 3rd, 1967. 
Speck was quickly recognized as a sociopath by a team of psychologists, but he was thankfully deemed competent to stand trial. Thank God. And basically, this is like this case is in the bag. They got fingerprints matched I to witnessed. Speck. They have an eyewitness testimony from Cora. Speck refused to take the witness stand throughout. He refused to talk about the case. He actually only had a formal interview one time. And it was just where he said he was drunk and high on acid. And he also said he had an accomplice who Speck said that he actually murdered, but there was nothing confirming this. Trying and, to yeah. spread the blame, yep. distribute the, the guilt. It's exactly. a bunch of freaking BS. Yeah. So our girl, Cora, actually during the trial leaves the witness stand, walks up to Speck, Whoa. points at him, and says, that's the man, that's the killer. That took some freaking she balls. Got, she has balls. So this trial lasted two weeks, and on April 15th, Speck was found guilty and sentenced to death in an electric chair. Mm -hmm. However, on June 29th, 1972, the Supreme Court deemed the death penalty unconstitutional, and he was resentenced to eight consecutive life terms. Beck petitioned for his parole seven times, and he was denied, thankfully, each time. So there was a video unearthed from Bill Curtis. For those of you who don't know, he is a journalist. Speck is in prison for years at this point. Um, so in the video, Speck has oral sex with his male partner. And now he has characteristically female breasts. So he had been using illegal hormone therapy while he was incarcerated. And in this video, he actually talks about the murders and he's doing marijuana and cocaine. Somehow he's doing these drugs in the prison, which I don't know how they got all these drugs in the prison, but they of, have them. There's a lot of drugs in prison. Yeah, they have all kinds of stuff in prison. Speck opens up about the murders in this pornographic video, basically. He, he's very relaxed in the video. He's got a very lighthearted demeanor while talking about the eight women that he killed. And he goes on to say that it started off as a burglary and then all hell broke loose, quote unquote. So he said that one spit on his face, and she said that she would pick him out of a lineup. So he went into a rage and killed her, and then killed the two who walked in because they were witnesses. So here he is talking about, most likely, Pam Wilkening, Mary Ann Jordan, and Suzanne Ferris. So remember, Pam was the first one he pulled aside, and then Mary Ann and Suzanne came in and surprised him. I don't know the order if he killed Pam and then murdered Mary Ann and Suzanne because they witnessed it. I don't know. I don't I really don't know what was going on in this guy's head. It sounds like he is just trying to rationalize and come up with some kind of reasonable as terrible as it is, but reason for yeah. doing this senseless murder. Or these senseless murders, I should say. So that's one thing. You're right. That's one thing that quote unquote spiked his rage okay and another thing that spiked his rage was that gloria looked like his first wife oh my god and this triggered him and he said this is just crazy to me so he said that gloria davy was the only one who was sexually assaulted he even said, she was the only one who flirted with me. She was the last one. I knew I had all the time in the world with her. And Speck said, I put my gun under her jaw to threaten her. And he said, get naked, B word. Gloria was strangled to death. And the bed sheets that he used to tie up their hands, he used to strangle them. The bed sheets around Gloria's neck were so tight that the detective who found her couldn't even fit his finger in between her neck and the fabric. It was that tight to undo it. Speck in the video also is asked, What are you locked up for? And Speck responds, Eight counts of murder. 
And he's asked, did you do it? And he said, sure, I did. Uh And they said, why? And he said, it just wasn't their night. And then he giggled. He died in 1991 of a heart attack at a nearby hospital. But that's about it. I feel so terrible for all the families who were impacted by this case and all the nursing students and nurses that were impacted as well. They all were really beautiful people who suffered because of this little person. Just some concluding thoughts before we wrap this up. The fact that he was living a his best life in prison and having and he was the enjoying opportunity. himself. Yeah, that's really disturbing to me. Um thinking about him enjoying his life and not really yes, he's in jail, yes he's serving life sentences, but still able to and I think that's why a lot of people feel so strongly about the capital punishment. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. It's a very personal and uh, difficult decision, but I understand the merit on both sides. And he was asked, like, why he did it. And he said, if you're asking if I ever felt sorry, no. He's a sociopath. He's this guy is something else. I just don't I don't have any words for him. He's like the picture chi- the picture book sociopathic yeah. personality disorder. Yeah. He no remorse. I wonder about his childhood too. But the thing is a lot of times people have trauma but that morph and change who they are, but sometimes people are just born freaking bad. Yeah. And he may have been one of those that was just a bad apple from the start. He he did have a, a absolutely no excuse for his behavior, but he did have a rough, very rough childhood. I think there was abuse going on, and but obviously, no, it does not discount anything that he's done to to these women. There's people who have the worst trauma, you know, histories, and they go on to be members of society that don't hurt other people instead they try to empower other people and assist others because i think that's what this is all really about in this life not do no harm and help other people and richard speck i am happy that you are not with us in this world and may you reap yours in the next well said. But anyway, thank you all for tuning in. And I, if you enjoyed it today, feel free to like us, rate us, subscribe to us, follow us, whatever the kids do these days. This episode was very dark, Chris. I will call the time of death. The time is 917. Bye. Bye.